Hello and welcome everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome back to another subsector spotlight from Sectors Made Simple. I'm pleased to be here with you all to talk about a very interesting subsector that is a particular interest to me as a video game player myself, but one that has a lot of potential, not just as an investment, but funny enough, as economies as well. Today, I want to talk about the video game industry. And yes, the video game industry includes multimedia. But as far as we're concerned, multimedia is a very small portion of what this industry really is. So I want to cover the video game portion in a little bit more detail. Talk about its value to people like me, people like you, but then also value to other countries. Video games for some are not just a pastime, it's a career. So I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about all aspects of the video game and esports industry, cover some of the biggest companies that are involved in this industry, and lastly, we're gonna talk about some ETFs that provide you easy exposure to the video game, esports, and digital world as a whole. So before we get started, I want to welcome everyone we have with us in the webinar today live. As a reminder, these webinars are done live on YouTube every single Friday at 4 p.m. Los Angeles time, 7 p.m. New York, Florida, or anywhere on the east side. So, hello, Emelida, Yesenia, Chela, Elizabeth, my mother, Blaze, Olga, Ernestina, Blanca, Lupe, Laura, Laura, I sent you an email yesterday about the shirt. Hopefully you, you got that. Um, Andrew, Maida, Kike, and so many more. Great to see you all. Let's get straight into the action. So today is going to be about electronic gaming, esports, and to a certain extent, multimedia. Usual disclaimer. We're talking about companies, we're not going to really cover strategies, but whenever we're talking about financial topics, when you're watching it the day of, yeah, it's the information is relevant. But every second that goes by, it becomes less and less so, which is why we try and focus on the concepts and the lessons, not the prices. Because prices change, information and lessons don't really. So... Please take these as educational resources. Any examples are educational examples, and past results can never guarantee future performance. So let's get straight into the presentation. So what exactly is the electronic gaming industry? Huh, confused why I'm not getting my, getting my little one-at-a-time things, but we're going to roll with it. So... Electronic gaming and multimedia is an industry classified by Finviz under the communication services sector. This industry is made up of two similar but different sub-industries, or just areas, let's say. Oh, hi, Magnolia, sorry. Um, electronic gaming is one portion of it. Now, we're not talking... Microsoft and Sony here. We're not talking PlayStation and Xbox or Nintendo. We're talking video game developers. People that make video games and sell the video games to people. Then we have multimedia. Multimedia are video hosting and sharing websites, but also in the case of mostly Avid, video editing software. But Let's start off now by talking a little bit about multimedia so we can get it out of the way and then focus on the biggest industry and the one that's very interesting. Multimedia are services that offer you the ability to edit videos, upload the videos, and share them with your friends, loved ones, or enemies, depending on what kind of video. But many of these big video hosting companies, like, for example, the one we're doing this webinar on, YouTube. YouTube is a video hosting and sharing website. 
but it's not included in the list of multimedia companies. And the reason is, is they do a lot more than just YouTube. YouTube is part of Google. So Google does a little bit more than just YouTube, which is why it's not exactly in this subsector. However, there are a few multimedia companies that are, are in this industry, and we'll cover some of them later, but the big one on this list is going to be Avid. They produce video editing software called Pro Tools that is one of the industry standards for editing not only video, but music as well, or audio as well. But for now, I just want to talk about the real story here, the big story, gaming. But before we talk about gaming, let's talk about this weird thing that video games are technology, but video gaming is not in technology. It's a sub-industry or an industry of communication services. Why? Well, Video games have gone a little bit beyond just a single player game or even a local multiplayer game where you have two controllers and you play against the person standing next to you for bragging rights, money, whatever it might be that you all are betting on. But today, many, many, many game companies that have gone public create massive multiplayer games that allow you to play with others in the real world that see millions of unique users per day. So because of this, gaming is more than just a game. It's a network. It's a community. Because much of gaming today requires the internet. We need to have an internet connection to play these games. And when we connect to the internet, the internet is nothing. The internet is just like the mailman that delivers you your mail. They send you the package and that package is the website or is the game. But the game needs to live somewhere. Someone needs to send you that package. And that's where we have these things called servers. Servers are the person on the other end that sends you that package. It's where the game is. So players connect to those servers, and then from that server, many people will be in that same server. Then they can play together or against each other, whatever the game might be. So while gaming, yes, uses technology, yes, the game might be on Xbox or Sony, but in the connected world of gaming, and most definitely in video creation, hosting, and sharing, a lot of it relies on these servers, on communication between different things, different people. So because of that, this industry falls under the communication services umbrella. Now, let's talk gaming. We're not going to just talk about for example, Farmville. Yes, we will, funny enough, talk about Farmville later on. I know many of you have probably heard of it, played it in the past, maybe play it today. But just how big is the gaming industry? I'll tell you this. I did not expect this at all. And it's fascinating because we all look at things from a very... What's the right word? For lack of a better term, American perspective. We think of things as it relates to the United States. And we think because the U.S. is this big titan of industry, this huge economy, that we dominate the world. We consume everything. We cr create everything. But that's not the case. So let's just look at how big gaming really is. So in 2020, 
What if I told you that the U.S. was actually the small, uh, sorry, not just the U.S., the U.S. and Canada, n what's called North America, or N.A., is the smallest region in terms of revenue for gaming. In 2020, the video games industry was valued at 100, just short of 160 billion U.S. dollars globally. And that's not where, it's not going down anytime soon. That number is expected to continue to grow to 200.8 billion by 2023. If we were to break it out by region, where is this revenue coming from? North America is the smallest region by a mile at just 6 billion US dollars. Second, good old Europe, Africa, and the Middle East at 35 billion US dollars. Latin America is valued at 40 billion dollars. And lastly, Asia Pacific and Oceania is valued at 78 billion dollars. What was very interesting to me is when I started doing a lot of this research, I found out that, well, actually, I'm going to save this point. It, it's fascinating, and it'll come in in a little bit here. But this is the fascinating part. There is billions upon billions upon billions of dollars spent by people. And about 95% of that revenue comes from free-to-play games. A lot of this money is spent on games that are free to download, free to start playing, but you pay eventually. You pay for things in the game, you pay for bonuses, or you pay for premium membership, whatever it might be. The majority of revenue comes from games that are free to start playing. The only thing you need to start playing that game is an internet connection, a computer, and the desire to get a little bit frustrated at the game or your teammates. Speaking of teammates, let's talk about, we talked about the money. And while money talks, people play. And by person counts, gaming is huge. Let's look at exactly how big. In the global games market, there was 2.7 billion players worldwide in 2020. Once again, the US is the tiniest, with 203 million gamers. That accounts for 35% of the population of both Canada, the US, and some areas in North America that aren't that. Funny enough, Mexico is considered to be part of Latin America, not North America. Speaking of Latin America, second biggest audience, where Latin America has 259 million gamers. That's 39% of the population. Europe, Africa, and the Middle East come in second place at 758 million, about 34% of the population. And lastly, by far the biggest population because, well, they're the biggest, but not at the expense of the real percent of people. Asia Pacific has 1.5 billion gamers in 2020. That's 35% of the population there. So next time you go to the supermarket, look around you. Look to your right, look to your left. Chances are, if you're not the person that plays the games, one of those two people are. That is how big we're talking here. Now, this is where things get very, very fun. Because there are many things in our lives that are products. We buy them because we need them or because they make our lives a little bit better. But for many myself included, gaming is not just a product, but 
is a lifestyle. To many gamers, it's not just a product you buy. It is an entire new world with its own culture, communities, and in many, many, many cases, economies. Many games have millions of users from all different cultures, nationalities, and languages. And as I mentioned before, many of these games include the ability for you to play with or against people from all over the world. I want to give just one little anecdote, a little story here. When I was traveling with Kira, we spent two days in Korea. I slept for eight hours. The remainder of the time we were in Korea, we stay or we spent our time in what's called a PC bang. It is a internet cafe, but not like the ones that you see that have the really old computers and all of that. No, we are talking a room of hundreds of computers that are easily $2,000 each computer. And you can go sign in, pay with your credit card, and it's $2, $3 to play video games for an hour. These computers can play any game, have any game already downloaded, and all you need to do is log in and start playing. You can sit down and you can order food, drinks, snacks, funny enough, even stuffed animals, right to your seat. And someone will deliver you a little to-go meal so that you can stay and continue playing video games. And it's not just video games. It's mostly video games. But because of the culture that these communities have created, it is given the ability for people like students to have cheap access to computers. Because of gamers, people can access the internet without needing to buy their own computer or spend thousands of dollars on a high. Sorry about that. That's the problem with wireless microphones. They have a battery life. But as I was saying, this video game community impacts a lot beyond just the video games. Now, there's one side, I've talked mostly here about the we play video games for fun side of things. But for some, video games and gaming is not just for fun. It's a career. Because when millions upon millions of people play games that involve playing with or against other players, of course there's going to be people who try and compete to see who is the best at that game. And this has created an entirely new industry called esports. Esports is an extremely wide category for competitive video games. We're not just talking one game, we are talking hundreds of different games with thriving esports communities. And not only that, because of how much money there is in esports, there are global companies that do nothing but own and manage esports teams. If any of you are familiar with basketball, the Lakers player Rick Fox actually started his own esports team called Echo Fox. It was owned and managed by Rick Fox in support of his son, who got into competitive gaming, never made it professionally, but wanted to participate. And his dad saw the potential that this industry had invested millions of his own dollars into this industry and created a very, very successful team that now represents multiple different teams across different games. There are big, big investors getting into the management 
and the sponsorship side of esports. It has gone from a small local event that only the people around this neighborhood or this town or city might go to, to a global phenomenon. Large games such as Dota, which stands for Defense of the Ancients, LOL or League of Legends, and CSGO, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, have global tournaments that attract millions of people to watch online, thousands to show up and attend the event with prize pools upwards of hundreds of thousands, or in the case of International for Dota 2, millions of dollars. Dota currently holds the world record for the largest esports prize pool in the world. Just a bit over $2 million for the winning team. And that's just for the winning team. Beyond the teams competing, there are esports tournaments held in some of the largest venues in the world. And this is not for gaming here. This is only for the esports, the competitive sports side of things. In 2021, the global esports market is valued just over $1 billion. Not for the games, not for the free-to-play side of things, only for the competitive, the competitive side. People buying tickets to attend these events. Sponsors investing millions of dollars to have their name shown on these live-streamed tournaments. And yes... The teams themselves have to pay to be part of this organization. And we've only talked about the players and the tournaments. But esports has created a new digital world of sponsorships, teams and clubs. And of course, when you have teams, you're going to have fans as well. These fans not only watch the game, but bring the digital world to the real world. Many fans will do what's called cosplay, where they will create costumes and dress up as their favorite characters from the game. And even cosplay has professionals who get paid by not only just creators, but video game players, as, or sorry, um, organizations and video game companies as well to create and wear costumes at various events, including esports matches and gaming conventions. Now, while I may not be a professional, I have done some cosplay in the past alongside Kira. There is a, a couple, a guy and a girl couple from League of Legends named Zaya and Rakan that we liked because the two of them are lovingly lovingly rude to each other. So we felt like it fitted us pretty well. And for a video game, or sorry, a gaming convention in Boston, we ended up dressing up as two of the characters from League, Zaya and Rakan. So here's a picture of Kira and I dressed up as the two characters from the game walking around the convention the entire day. Then <laughs> Neri shows up at the most random time. Congratulations, this is now our investment conversation. It's staring at pictures of me and Kira in costumes. But the funny thing is, we weren't alone. The picture on the right is three other characters from the exact same game, all cosplaying different characters. So it's fascinating to attend one of these events, either in cosplay yourself, or to see others dressed up as a game that has inspired them in some way, shape, or form. Now, I haven't just cosplayed characters. I've also attended esports events locally. League of Legends is owned by a US company, called Riot Games, and they are centered in Santa Monica in Los Angeles. I've gone down to their studio five or ten times to watch different matches be played. So the picture you see right here is me at one of the professional matches for the North American teams. 
Then I've also been to national championships where we attended the um, the semifinals for the world championships. This one actually was not in TD Garden. I think I got the images Madison flipped. Square. I know. This one was at Madison Square Garden in New York. But we've also been to the North American finals at TD Garden in Boston. So you may not be familiar with esports, but it's booking out some of the biggest venues in the entire US, but also the entire world. You know the Bird's Nest, the old sports stadium built in China for the 2008 Beijing Olympics? Or wait, no, 2012. 2008. 2008 Beijing Olympics. Yeah, the League of Legends World Finals was hosted at the Bird's Nest, and they sold out the entire venue. It's pretty wild to see video games selling out sports arenas. What I was going to say before, as far as revenue goes in Brazil, soccer is the biggest. There's no surprise there. Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, or sorry, not Ronaldo, uh, Pele, some of the biggest names in soccer come from, come from uh, Brazil. However, the second biggest sport is League of Legends. League of Legends and Counter-Strike Global Offensive are the number two and three highest grossing sports in Brazil. Now, that is the business side of things. But I want to talk quickly about the economics, the money side of things. Because while there is significant money going into and coming out of the gaming industry... Whenever there's money involved, there's going to be some black markets as well. So I mentioned before how some video games have their own economies with the in-game currencies that the game uses. You can sell things to other players and buy things from other players, and those trades require money. So when something holds a certain value, after all, that's just what a currency is, right? A currency is anything that people will buy or sell that has a known value. That's what a cryptocurrency is. Crypto has no physical backing in the real world. Crypto is just what someone else is willing to pay for that thing. Video games are no different. You can collect rare items in video games and then sell them to another player for sometimes upwards of 10, maybe 100, or sometimes even thousands of dollars just for pixels in a video game. Gaming is global. It is a industry that is across the globe. It is huge. Now, the funny thing, oh, well, not funny, it is not funny at all. One of the interesting things is that because of these economies, many nations where people can't afford the just standard of living or where wages are just horrible have turned to video games as a way of paying their bills. There are many examples of this, and this is not the only country that is facing this issue, but it is one that I wanted to highlight just because it shows the real gravity and situation that is going on in the world, really. I'm going to use the example here of Venezuela. In the past five years, Venezuela has faced a horrible case of hyperinflation of thousands of percent a year. In 2018, the worst of this hyperinflation. Venezuela's currency experienced, remember, in the US, we have about 2 to 5% inflation. 5% in a bad year, 2%, maybe 1% in a good year. Venezuela in 2018 had 
inflation. Because of that hyperinflation, national wages are no longer enough for the average person to survive. This says monthly, but that's misleading. It should say annual. The annual minimum wage in Venezuela is $2.40 US, but no one's getting paid that. If you look up what the actual rate is for uh, any of the like revenue or sorry not revenue the salaries the monthly salary in Venezuela is about 132,000 bolivars. If we were to convert that to US dollars with today's value, it would be about 0 0.00018 US dollars. So that's what someone's making. But the cost of living doesn't change much because people need food. People need gas. Cars need gas. Gas prices are set by OPEC. It's crazy how just massive this problem really is. So because of it, many Venezuelans have turned to video games as a way of supporting their families. What they'll do is they will play the video game, not for fun, but as a job and then sell that in-game currency or services in that game. They will play the game for you and you pay them for US dollars because you can use US dollars to buy food or pay for bills. In many cases in Venezuela, you can't even use the national currencies. They won't accept it. They will only accept US dollars because their currency is worth nothing. One of these games that's heavily used by people looking to support themselves or their families is called RuneScape. In this game, gold, which is the currency, can be sold for US dollars on the black market. Somewhere around 45 cents per million gold. Then a worker can earn about 1.5 to 2 million gold per hour, resulting in about 60 to 80 cents an hour for that worker. So with about 250 hours of work, a worker can make enough to support themselves for the month. And this is a horrible amount of work. This is 250 hours in a month just to survive. But when you're comparing it to the average hourly rate for a worker in Venezuela, which is 0 0.00018 US dollars. 60 to 90 cents per hour is pretty good. Now, while we've just used Venezuela as the example, many countries around the world have turned to video games, not as a source of fun, not as a pastime, but as a way to make a living. These games have created real economies within the game, just within the game, that in some cases are more stable than the economies of real world countries. I've listed Venezuela as one, but another one is Egypt, China, even Cuba. There are many people in Cuba that have started using virtual private networks or VPNs to connect to games like RuneScape, play the game, and then sell the money in the game for real world US dollars. Because in many cases, you're going to end up making tens or hundreds of times more money playing a video game and selling the currency in the game because their economies are thriving. People play the game the currency has real world value and that value does not change much. In the case of these four countries I just listed, that is the case. Yes, for China, China's economy is booming, but for the average person, it is not. So for many of these cases, it is, it is the best job you can get 
is playing a video game because their economies are more stable than your country's. So let's go back to the company side of things and let's get into the thing that you guys are talking about. How do we invest in video game companies? So I'm going to tell you this right now so that we kind of get our expectations about right. The number of publicly traded video game companies is pretty small, but it is growing and growing and growing. As more and more investors, both professional investors that are venture capitalists looking to invest their money in things, pub or traders like you and me that want to invest in a company that sounds cool and is growing, but also institutions, we're likely going to see more and more of these companies go public. Now, with that said, let's go and take a look at some of the companies that are currently public, as well as some ETFs that will give us exposure to this industry. So some of the publicly traded gaming companies, this is not multimedia, this is only gaming companies, are Activision Blizzard, ATVI. Activision Blizzard makes games like Overwatch, like uh, World of Warcraft, and also Call of Duty, if any of you are kids and play Call of Duty, or have kids and they play Call of Duty, Activision Blizzard is the company that makes it. Then we have EA, Electronic Arts. They make games such as Star Wars Battlefront and many of the old um, sports games that you may have played growing up or your kids may play today, such as Madden, NBA, any of those sports games likely are done by EA. Then there's Engine Media Holdings with the ticker symbol GAME. While they don't have any large games that are played here, they do have many large games that are played and consumed in Asia Pacific. Again, we are not the US is not the big gaming industry. Asia is. For whatever reason, Asia is where most of the money is coming from for these video game companies. One that I saw was already mentioned in the chat, but is one we're going to talk about right now. Roblox, RBLX, publicly traded company for a video game that is extremely popular with young kids that gets them building. It gets them making things, but also interacting with others and working on social skills. Then there is Take-Two Interactive, who makes a little bit more um, mature games, such as um, Grand Theft Auto, as well as Red Dead Redemption. Then we have Zynga, Z-N-G-A, who makes good old Farmville. Not only do they make Farmville, but they also make a lot of other mobile games that you may know about, such as Candy Crush and more. And then the last one, Skills Inc., you may not have heard about, but I wanted to include here because it is one of the few entries on our list that is actually involved in, um, in esports. They manage and oversee esports communities for many smaller games. Esports is extremely expensive. You need not only a good game, but a production team, uh, casters, uh, analysts, team support. There is a massive amount of work that goes into an esports thing. Just think about any sports broadcast you've ever watched. Someone needs to operate the camera. Someone needs to create the jersey. Someone needs to build the stadium. Someone needs to cast it. Someone needs to commentate. All of these things cost money. And not all game developers have that money. So skills helps to create that community for people. Uh, someone is asking about international game technology, IGT. I left that one off because IGT focuses a lot on not so much multiplayer gaming, but 
um, gambling gaming. There is a absolutely huge online gambling industry, but do you know how on this presentation we had one slide, two slides about the black market? Gaming how would be mostly black market because even the legitimate companies use some very not not US friendly ways of getting around laws. If you ever look at where many of these online gambling sites are registered, they're always registered in the Cayman Islands, Turks and Caicos, other offshore places that have much, much, much less strict rules for what is and isn't okay. So I wanted to avoid that one just because it's... Yes, it is a gaming company, but the values and the reason behind its revenue is completely different. So I didn't really want to include that on this list. Now, these are all of the companies. Let's now go and look at the ETFs that are involved in the gaming and multimedia area. IEME is iShares. Oh, there you go, Kike. There. The, I always will include the companies in the ETFs for you. Don't you worry about that. IEME is iShares US Media and Entertainment. This is focused much more on the video hosting and multimedia side of things, but is also going to give you a little bit of exposure to other industries within communication services. There is IGN, iShares North America Multimedia Networking. This is focusing on video hosting sites in the United States and Canada. Then we have ticker symbol BJK, which is Van Eck Global Gaming. Then we have Hero, Global X Video Games and Esports. Then Nerd, N-E-R-D, which is Round Hill Esports and Digital Entertainment. And lastly, Espo, or Espo, which is Van Eck Video Gaming and Esports. What I want to do with you all now is I want to visit the matrix and I want to start a custom matrix to be made while we're talking about the takeaways. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a custom matrix using these six companies and then the overarching ETF for it, XLC, communications. So we're going to go in and create a custom matrix using these six ETFs, and then our benchmark, which is going to be communication services. So we've got our seven tickers selected. We're going to click create, and we're now running a custom matrix. We'll check back on this in a few minutes here. But why did I talk about communications today? It's not just because video games are fun and cool. Um, it's because communications is performing extremely well right now. Communications has the second highest total count on the matrix and has also been improving. If we look at the previous matrix, we see that it's gaining momentum and while it might not be a leader in the past week, it was the second strongest sector last week. And after all of the movement this past week, we're still seeing it as the second strongest sector. So communications is looking really good right now. And I wanted to cover an, a industry in it that many of you might not know about, but is growing and growing very quickly. Video games are part of society now, and it's not just a pastime for many. I'm getting into the actual takeaways, so let's actually just go to the takeaways here. They've grown far beyond just a way to pass our time. They've created vibrant, diverse, and absolutely massive communities that in some cases are more stable economies than 
other nations. So in those cases, it provides opportunities to people from those countries to make a living beyond what they might be able to in their country. And we're going more digital. Our society is moving more digital, and it always will be. So the possibilities of what video games allow us to do will continue to grow, as will the number of companies that go public. While we're waiting for that custom matrix to finish, I want to share a really quick story with you all. I'm working right now to get better at Spanish. It is something that I've always been around, but have never really spoken much of. A way that many people wishing to practice a language will learn is they will go in to, mostly there's a virtual reality game called VR Chat. You can enter into virtual reality and go into a room with other people from around the world. And many of these communities are centered, not in English, in Spanish in Portuguese, in Chinese, in Japanese. So one way that many people are practicing their Spanish or their Chinese is by going into a video game and immersing themselves in that community. They are only speaking with people from China or from Spanish-speaking nations and using that as a way of practicing. Video games are so much more beyond just a game to pass the time. It's an educational opportunity for some, a career for others, and a way of just making enough money to live for others, or for some, rather. So, while I don't put on my VR headset and go in and try and talk Spanish to a bunch of people, I do practice my Spanish quite frequently in the different games that I play. Also, uh, I know Blaze has pointed it out before, but the chair that I sit in is actually a League of Legends chair. League of Legends is one of the largest games that I play. So I have a League of Legends chair. Kira has a League of Legends chair. It, again, to us, it's more than just a video game. It is a culture. It is a way for us to spend time with our friends, both that are in San Diego, but also our friends back east that are still in Boston or New York. We all can hop on, join a video call or a voice call together and play some games as a community. So with all of that said, let's go and take a look at our custom matrix, shall we? So here we see the custom matrix that we just ran. We see up at the top, as far as total count is concerned, we have Van Eck Global Gaming, BJK. Close behind is Van Eck Video Gaming and Esports. What is very fascinating here to look at is where a lot of this is going. BJK and Espo are both global looking industries. We are looking here at global companies and global markets. Hero is big, but is not as big. And at the very bottom are the US-based ETFs. What this is showing us, and this might just be a today in the market kind of thing, but what this is showing us is that a lot of the strength right now for this growing industry is not in the US, it's in the world. It is with global companies that are available to be traded in the US, but might not be centered in the US. The last thing that I want to show you all is I want to go over to Finviz and I want to click on the group for electronic gaming and multimedia to show you some of the other companies and show you just how small the US really is in terms of all of these companies. Now keep in mind, for example, Activision Blizzard, they are a very large company and a lot of their sales are, or they are a US-based company, but there's a lot more that they do than just create video games. So $62 billion is not 
all from video games. They do other stuff as well. But here we see companies like Activision Blizzard, EA, and Roblox. But in the middle, we see some others that are worth talking about. We see Avid Technology, the creator of Pro Tools, one of the largest video editing software tools in the world. Then we have others such as the Nine Limited, which is a Chinese-based video hosting platform. It is their version of YouTube that is available to be traded in the U.S. exchange market. Then there are others such as Motorsport Games, Inspired Entertainment, and then even ones from outside of the U.S., including Gravity from South Korea and Integrated Media Technology from Hong Kong. If we hop over to the last part of the list, here we're going to see Super League Gaming and Skills, which are two esports companies. And then the last one we're talking about on this list is going to be good old Zynga, the mobile gaming platform and the company that made its big name with Farmville. A very goofy game, but one that has created a ton of revenue. Keep in mind that some of the most successful games by revenue are the games that are free. Video gaming is a pastime, a hobby, or sometimes a career that has an incredible low barrier to entry. Many of these games are free to download and free to start playing. And some of them will charge you money to get an advantage, while others will charge you money just for your character to look cooler. There's no right or wrong here. The companies are making money off of games that are free to get started, but you can spend as you wish. And the best games are the ones that never make it required to spend money, but make it feel good to spend money. It is, it is something that is always going to continue growing. New gaming companies are always emerging. And there are many other extremely large groups, such as Tencent, that it are involved in buying video game companies and then managing them. Tencent is one of the largest video game, or is one of the largest investment groups in the world. And the main thing that they invest in is video games. They own a very large part of Activision Blizzard. They own a lot of Riot Games, the company that does League of Legends, and they are always expanding what they have in their holdings. So don't expect video games to go anywhere anytime soon. Expect video games to continue growing, and as access to, tech, or as access to the internet and our connected world continues to expand to new communities, expect for video games to become and continue becoming a large, inclusive, and highly lucrative area of our interconnected world. So, that's what I have for you all. Video games are neat. They are fascinating, they are fun, and they connect people. Locally, across the country, and even globally. It is an amazing experience to get to travel to a foreign country, have no idea how to speak the language, but as soon as you hop into a video game with another person, you both speak the same language there. Win. Or have fun trying. So, thank you all so much for joining us today for a very interesting and underappreciated industry that is global and local all at the same time. I really appreciate you all participating and joining us for this webinar, and we'll be back next week with another subsector spotlight. If there's a subsector that we have not covered yet that you would like to hear about, feel free to send us an email at support at sectorsmadesimple.com. I'm always looking for more ways and more areas that I can create investing material to help you understand the market or invest in the market just a little bit simpler. Thank you all so much. We'll see you all back next week. Have a great weekend. Bye.